So welcome everybody to the final Entour Live of 2024. And it will be me talking to you today about gardening for earthworms. So I'll be going through the mutual benefits of an earthworm friendly garden. So talking about why earthworms are good for your garden and how you can garden in a way that's good for earthworms. Uh, it's going to be a little bit less scientific than the rest of the Entour Lives that we've had this year. And it's more about giving something back to all of the naturalists that have been attending um although we will go a little bit into the science at the end uh there is a little bit of a, an agenda with this talk in that i've got a citizen science project coming up that i'd like people to contribute to uh from their pool of garden earthworms so let's start with what is an earthworm i'm not going to go too much into detail about this but just as a, a quick reminder for it for people, earthworms are annelids, so they are segmented worms. Uh, this means they belong to the phylum Annelida. They're related to leeches and polychaete worms, which includes things like ragworms and lugworms. Um, in the UK, um, in the British Isles, we have about three, we, well, exactly three families of earthworms. One of them is our, the main family, Lumbricidae, and that contains most species uh that we have. The other two families are Canthodrillidae and Spargonophilidae. They each have a single species in them with, that is found within the UK and they're non-native. So they've been imported from elsewhere around the world. And both of those species are, are relatively rare. So they're not something that we're worried about damaging our earthworm populations, etc. So yeah, just this is just really to show you where earthworms fit within the wider animal kingdom within the phylum Annelida. Um, most of their relatives you'll see there are associated with aquatic environments, either freshwater or marine. Earthworms, like other annelids, breathe through their skin, so they normally require a relatively moist environment to live in, and we normally find them within soils or, or similar habitats. So I think if we're going to talk about gardening for earthworms, the first question we need to think about is how many species of earthworm do we have in the UK? Um, so feel free to drop a guess in the chat. Um, some people might think this is a little bit of a trick question, but I did give you a clue earlier. Uh, anybody want to have a guess about how many species I think we might have? 10,000, one, two. I see a 37, 100, 31. Yeah, 31 spot on. So. If you go online, you'll see all sorts of numbers between 27 and 31. I can tell you that officially in the UK, we have 30. Uh, there is an additional species that is found in Ireland that we hadn't found in the UK, but Natural England have recently found it. And we're just, I've got the specimen actually uh, in my house, and I just need to take it to the Natural History Museum to be confirmed. But it's looking like we will have 31 in the UK. We certainly have 31 in the British Isles. So if we include Ireland as well, uh, across Ireland and, and the UK countries, we have 31. So it's important to, this is an important aspect when we're thinking about gardening for earthworms, because that means we've got 31 different kinds of earthworm. And those earthworms will be doing different things. They'll have different needs. So when we're talking about gardening for earthworms, what's right for one species might not necessarily be right for another. And what I'm going to do in this talk is go through what the different types of earthworms are, what some of their needs might be, what functions are they providing for your garden, what services are they providing for your garden, and what can we do to maybe help them out a little bit as well. So I mentioned that there's 31 different species in the UK and Ireland. Um, a simple way of breaking these down, if not necessarily um, the most correct way to do it, is to break them into what we call ecological categories. So ecological categories, in theory, categorizes earthworms by their behavior and where they're found in the soil profile. And you'll hear three terms a lot, anisic, which refers to deep burrowing earthworms, which are normally quite large. Um, endogeic, which refers to shallow burrowing, soil feeding earthworms. And epigeic earthworms, which refers to surface dwelling, the earthworms that feed on decaying plant 
or material or animal waste rather than soil. I'm going to go into them in a bit more detail later, so don't worry, but I just wanted to drop it in now that you've got these different earthworms living in different places and doing slightly different jobs. So if we go back to 1881, Charles Darwin um, wrote a book on earthworms, uh, The Formation of Vegetable Mould Through the Action of Worms. Possibly not the catchiest of titles, but that didn't mean it wasn't his best-selling book within his lifetime. So much did much better within his lifetime than uh, that other book that caused a lot of controversy at the time. Um, and within this book, he made a statement that is still very true today. And it's the mantra by which I and the other members of the Earthworm Society kind of live our life, which is worms have played a more important part in the history of the world than most persons would at first suppose. So they're really important. They do a lot of jobs. Um, and what are those important jobs that they do? So you can't really talk about earthworms without talking about soil. So when we think about soil formation and soil processes, we can divide these up into four different types of um, action, if you will. So first of all, you've got additions. So this is when things are added to the soil. Uh, and earthworms will play a part in all the things that I'm going to mention. So first of all, things can be added to the soil. So if we think of this something like, for example, if an animal excretes on top of the surface, or if a, a tree drops its leaves, those aspects of, of that material is going to end up within the soil. So it's being added to the soil. Uh, secondly, you've got translocation. So soil can be moved around. So it can be moved up through the layers of the soil or down through the layers of the soil. And earthworms obviously play a part in that with their burrowing, etc. Uh, you've got transformation. So this is when soil is converted from one thing to another. Uh, so it might, for example, when minerals are changed, which might be through, for example, the changes that happens to particles when they go through the earthworm's gut. And then losses. So that's where soil is taken out. So it might be when it's gone right through the profile, when it's dug up, etc. So yeah, those are the four types of soil processes that are involved in soil formation. Now, if we think about earthworms and those four soil processes uh, and the soil processes that they're involved with, uh, we can see that earthworms are involved in decomposition, uh, which is the breakdown of leaf litter and organic matter. Uh, so they incorporate that leaf litter into the soil and they stimulate microbes to, to help with that as well. Uh, they're involved in nutrient cycling. So that involves releasing of nitrogen in casts. So earthworm casts are their poo that they leave on the surface or within the soil. Uh, they transform nutrients and again, they stimulate microbes. We're going to go through these in a bit more detail in a sec. Uh, they're also involved in soil pore creation. So we've got the deep vertical burrows of those anesic earthworms. We've also got the horizontal burrow network from feeding activities of those endogenic, those shallow burrowing earthworms. And then we've got soil aggregate formation. Uh, and that happens through their excreted mucus. Um, and also uh, it's modified soil in the casts as well. I should say cast not cases. And those different soil processes result in what we call ecosystem services. So these are services provided by nature. And the, the ones that relate to the soil processes that earthworms are a big part of include recycling of waste and detoxification. Uh, it includes carbon and nutrient regulation, water flow regulation, so allowing drainage and things like that and soil structure maintenance. So making sure that the soil is the right kind of structure for the right kind of, for the habitats and environments that we have. Uh, and all of these lead to an ecosystem services, a service which is biomass production. So earthworms are a really important part of the food chain. And we wouldn't have a lot of the animals that we love and think are cute and fluffy, like hedgehogs, foxes, uh, all sorts of garden birds, would really struggle if they didn't have earthworms to feed on. So I'm going to go into all this in a bit more detail and relate it to the different types of earthworms as well. So looking at earthworms in decomposition first, uh, on the left, you can see we've got a tree. 
and it's losing its leaves and those leaves are going into the soil. Uh, they've been broken down into minerals and that's been reabsorbed by the tree. So we've got a decomposition cycle here with the minerals. And those epigeic earthworms that live on the surface, they feed on the leaf litter and help break it down. Um, we've got the endogeic earthworms that are then feeding on the top layers of the soil and breaking that down further. And then we've got the anisic earthworms, which are feeding on the, the, the deep soil. Um, so the soil has moved through the profile, but also the leaves as well. And they're churning that, churning that up in their stomach. So what we can see here is the, the decomposition services that different groups of earthworms contribute to are all slightly different. So it's not just one type of earthworm we need for the whole cycle to work in a really efficient way. It's all of them. Um, so if we now move on to the next soil process, organic matter and nutrient cycling, I'm going to fly through this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, partly because it involves a lot of chemistry, which is not my fault here. But earthworms consume, digest and redistribute organic matter. So they move it around um, as well as consuming it. Um, they promote microbial activity and that accelerates organic matter breakdown. So the presence of earthworm, apart from them just eating it themselves, the presence of earthworms actually stimulates it to be broken down by bacteria more quickly as well. They reduce the ratio of carbon to nitrogen organic matter. So they're altering that. And they do that by converting nitrogen, nitrogen from nitrate or um, uh, into nitrate, sorry, from an um, from ammonium form. Now, what that means to the layman, which includes me, is they convert nitrogen from a form that can't be taken up by plants into a form that can. So they make that nutrient, nitrogen, available to the plants. And they do a similar, similar job with other uh, nutrients that plants require, such as potassium and phosphor, phosphorus as well, making it into available, available forms. They're also important for soil pore creation. Now, this is kind of, this is a, a no-brainer, really. It's quite easy. I don't need to do a lot of explaining for this. We've got earthworms burrowing in the soil. They're creating holes into the ground. They're creating these burrow systems throughout. That is really, really useful for um, water regulation within the soil and aeration of the soil as well. So they allow water to, to drain through so that it doesn't just stand there and become anaerobic. Uh, and lack oxygen, and they allow air into the soil as well. And, and all of these things are really important for the air-breathing organisms that live within the soil. And then the final soil, pro soil process is soil aggregate creation. So it's been estimated that up to 50% of the aggregates in the upper soil layers are due to earthworm activity. A soil aggregate is soil particles that are stuck together. Um, and that these soil aggregates will contain things like organic matter, soil particles, and fertilizers. So it's things like the mucus from earthworms, for example, will help these soil particles stick together. And it's these aggregates that give the soil its structure. So you may have noticed when you dig in different areas, the soil has very different structures. And, and this is all impacted by things like earthworms. Uh, different ecological groups will contribute differently. So, for example, depending on where they deposit their casts or how their casts, the, the consistency of their casts will, will impact the salt structure. Um, okay, so we know that earthworms are really important, but why should we care? Are there any threats to earthworms in our gardens? Well, unfortunately, there are. And... There's not a lot of research when it comes to the impacts of certain things on earthworms. So I've listed just a few here. Some of these have absolutely no research on them. So these are my, I suppose, my best guess, my opinion. And I'd like to see more research because I don't think we know whether there is a significant impact and if there is a significant impact, just how much of a threat they are to our earthworm populations. So first of all, something that has been um, quite well researched is the use of insecticides uh, and herbicides and, and other pesticides. So we know from agricultural studies that earthworms are really susceptible to this. 
they're more susceptible, soil biodiversity, for example, is more susceptible to neonicotinoids than pollinators, although most of the research tends to be on pollinators. So if we're using um if we're using herbicides and insecticides in our gardens, then that's going to have an impact on our farms. Now, I'm aware that most of the people that are on this call, if not all, will probably not be using insecticides in their garden. But it's important for us to be aware of this so that we can educate others. Uh, yeah. And kind of hand in hand with that is slug pellets. Now, recently, certain types of slug pellets have been made, uh, made illegal to sell, uh, which is a really great thing. Uh, a lot of slugs do a really good job as well. Um, but... I just wanted to let you all know that we did a survey of compost bins. And one of the questions that we asked was, were there earthworms present, even if you didn't put them there? And most people had earthworms in their compost bins, even if they hadn't actually uh, added earthworms to that compost bin, they managed to find their way there. And it was, it was a very, very high percentage. Now, a very low percentage of people reported in the survey that they'd put slug pellets in their compost bin. But from the from the few that did, the majority of them didn't have earthworms present. So there's a very, I think there's probably a very strong chance that the presence of slug pellets uh, is going to impact whether you've got earthworms or not as well. So when you're trying to control other invertebrates or other or plants with in your garden, you may inadvertently impact the earthworm populations as well. And that brings us on to another chemical that we may not be thinking about, and, and that's veterinary drugs. So whatever you treat your pets with is going to end up in the soils in your garden. So things like uh, worming tablets, when your dog urinates in the garden, uh, as some, some of that, some of the, the active ingredient is going to end up in your soil. And there is a chance that that could have uh, an impact on the earthworms. Again, I don't think this is something that has had a lot of research. I'm certainly not aware of, of much, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, digging. Now, I'm guessing most of you don't dig holes like this in your garden, and that, that's perfectly understandable. Um, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that having a no-dig routine will increase the number of earthworms that you get in your in your garden and and a good anecdotal example i have of this is i run a course or used to run a course called discovering earthworms for the field studies council online course and one of the assignments we would give people is to submit evidence of a, a field sign example of earthworms so that would be things like earthworm casts earthworm burrows and a couple of pictures i got had the most casts i've ever seen and this was from a couple of different people so i got in touch with them and said can i use your photos because these are fantastic and i thought about it as well and, and also asked did by any chance is this an area that you never dig and in in both cases it was so having a no dig approach in their garden seems to have resulted in a load of earthworm casts on the surface and that's indicative of some of the larger anisic earthworms that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Climate change, um, it's not something we can do a lot about on a very local scale, but as the earth were, uh, as the earth were, as the climate gets drier, as it gets more extreme, this could have uh, an impact on our earthworms. Uh, like I said, earthworms like it, our earthworms like it quite wet. They're used to the kind of um, weather that we have regularly, if we end up with much drier summers, this may impact on what species we have in the UK. Uh, it may make certain parts of the UK unsuitable uh, for our earthworm species. So it's just something to be aware of. Paving. So as an earthworm recorder, I unfortunately do have to collect earthworms and preserve them to be able to identify them because you need to look at microscopic features. Um, in order to be able to get a reliable ID. And I quite often um, get people saying to me, oh, uh, is what you're doing not going to have an impact? And my response is always, the impact I have will always be so minimal compared to somebody who paves over their garden. 
Uh, we're taking all that habitat away. Uh, we don't know what the impact of this is on the earthworm populations. We don't know similar for things like decking, etc. And that brings me to an another way of the the plant diversity on the surface of your garden, and that's plastic lawns. We know that plastics are harmful to earthworms. They do digest it. So we, but we don't know what the impact of plastic lawns is on earthworms. We don't know how much of that plastic is leaching into the soil. We don't know how much covering the ground like that is impacting earthworm populations, whether it has a larger impact on some species as opposed to others, whether it affects numbers, biomass, uh, fertility, et cetera. We, we don't know anything about it. So that's something I would always just advise against plastic lawns in general, to be honest. Um, food clearance. Now, what I mean by this is taking away the food that the earthworms uh, will eat. So that might be things like grass clippings. It might be leaves, etc. So, yeah, just bear in mind that if you want a tidy garden, you can always mulch your borders. Uh, just if you're removing decaying plant material from your garden, you're removing a food source for earthworms. And we'll come on to how that might impact earthworms later in the talk. Uh, another potential big threat is invasive flatworms. So we've got a number of different species that feed on earthworms. Uh, the, probably the two that people might know most about are the Australian flatworm and the New Zealand flatworm. And it's thought that they may tackle slightly different types of earthworms uh, with their prey. So they, they might be having different impacts. They certainly are found in, in different parts of the UK because they have diff they have different environmental preferences than New Zealand versus Australian ones. But if you've got a shaded back garden and a really sunny front garden, you could have both just in, in different gardens. Uh, a really big threat is the New Guinea flatworm. The New Guinea flatworm isn't in the UK yet. Uh, it is found in mainland Europe where it, is, it, it has caused problems for their earthworm population. So the way that we can help with this uh, in the UK is by avoiding buying potted plants or making sure that we do a thorough investigation of potted plants um, or that we buy out uh, buying things that we know have come from within the UK so there's less chance of us importing uh, new invasive species or spreading them around. And then finally, um, this is one I just added in. I've never heard anybody mention this before, but non-native plants. So I've looked for earthworms under rhododendron, for example, and I found none. I found it really difficult to find them. So there may be other non-native, there may be some non-native plants that are, do not produce a particularly earthworm-friendly environment within the soil. So it's just worth thinking about what you're planting. Uh, and same for earthworms as it is for anything else. Usually if you're planting uh, a nice variety of native things in your garden uh, that are locally sourced, and that, that's uh, much less likely to have a negative impact than if you're bringing in non-native non -native plants from garden centers. Okay, so we've got our threats. Let's talk about the different type of earthworms. So the first one that I've mentioned, the anisic earthworms, these are our deep burrowing earthworms. They live in deep vertical burrows, so they can go down meters. Um, they'll surface at night to feed on things like leaves and mate. Um, so if you go out at night down the garden path, you might see loads of these stretched out and kind of stuck together. That means they're having um, uh, earthworm kinky time. <laughs> uh, they feed on soil at all levels and leaves. Uh, they're normally dark red dorsally, so dark red on top uh, and darker towards the head. Uh, so, for example, Aparetta de longa, a really common anisic earthworm is called the black-headed worm. It's his common name. These are usually quite large in size. And in the UK, they can be up to 40 centimetres. So when I say large, uh, I'm not talking like largest beetle, large, etc. We're talking big animals here, up to 40 centimetres in length. Um, but that same species can be down below 20 centimetres as well. So there's quite a lot of range. And measuring a live earthworm is never an easy feat. So, like I said, what... We can find these deep, but they do live in a permanent vertical burrow, which means they, they can be found at any depth, really. Um, they will tend to go down deeper in winter to avoid um, the colder temperatures. 
and you might find them nearer the surface uh, in the in spring and autumn when they'll be feeding feeding more when it's moister, wetter, etc. Um, and a telltale sign of at least one species, Lumbricus terrestris, a lobworm, is what we call earthworm middens. And these are kind of entrance ways that they block up uh, on their in their burrows. So I don't know if you can see, but there's one here that it's made of um, it's made of twigs and earthworm casts or mud. Um, got another one here, and then you've got two here, which are probably the perfect distance for mating. Um, and when they come out at night, they'll quite often keep their tail anchored in the burrow. So earthworm casts, earthworm poo, the anesic earthworms tend to uh, do a lot of their casting on the surface. So you've got the species that have the earthworm middens. You'll also see with other anesic species, these towers of earthworm poo, these casts, um, and that's indicative of things like Aparectidea longa, uh, the black-headed worm, or Aparectidea nocturna, a very close relative. So anesic earthworms, what do they do? Well, they're involved in all of those soil, soil processes that we mentioned earlier, but they're particularly really important for soil pore creation. They're creating these quite big, wide burrows down deep into the soil. So they're creating those deep vertical burrows. But you can see they do have, uh, they do help with decomposition, nutrient cycling and soil aggregate formation as well. So how can we garden better for anesic earthworms? So first thing is, if you've got a big enough garden, make sure you've got a tree. Uh, they eat fallen leaves. Um, so a tree is gonna give them food. On top of that, uh, trees are great because they add variation to the soil. You've got areas that stay shaded, you've got areas that are getting leaves falling on them. So they add a little bit of, um, um, they make a bit of a mosaic habitat in your garden, so uh, soil-wise. So yeah, really, really great. Where you've got trees, you've normally got earthworms. Uh, while we're on the subject of trees, leave your leaves. If you leave the leaves, the earthworms will eventually clear them up. If you take them away, you're taking their food away. What the anesic earthworms will do is pull the leaves down into their burrows where they'll feed on them. So they'll pull them down at night where they'll feed on them um, even during the day as well. Uh, your grass clippings, you might want to leave some of your grass clippings as well because earthworms will, will eat that. So in summer, it provides a food source for them when all the leaves are on the trees. And this is going to be common throughout all the different groups, but deadwood is fantastic for all earthworm groups. Uh, although we talk about earthworms in the soil, earthworms do quite like to be near the surface. They don't come, they don't come to the surface because it's dangerous. But if you've got deadwood lying on the ground, you will get earthworms resting underneath. And you will get the it's the easiest way of finding and having a look at your anesic earthworms, because if you leave a log on the soil um, or a log pile on the soil long enough and then go and turn them over, you will find anesic earthworms underneath them. So next group is the endogenic earthworms, the shallow burrowing earthworms. Now, unlike the anesics, these do not come to the surface uh, very often. The only time you'll really find these coming to the surface is after rain, and they're doing that more for dispersal. They're not coming because they want to mate or find food. They'll mate underground. So these tend to look a lot more sickly in colour. They, they, they come in all sorts of colours and sizes, but they tend to be quite pale, and they can be a pale pink, uh, they can be green, they can be brown, they can be blue, grey, green, all sorts, yellow, uh, and any combination of those colours as well. There's a lot of variation in the colours of endogenic earthworms, sometimes even within a species. Uh, this might be impacted by what they eat um, as well. I've, I've noticed differences in colours when I've looked in different um, habitats, when I'm, particularly when I've looked in wet areas. Um, so they will be living in horizontal burrows in the upper layers of the soil. They will reuse burrows, so we call them semi-permanent burrows, but they will be feeding on the soil all the time. So these are just munching away on the soil, feeding on the soil, and breaking that, those top layers of soil down further. Um, and yeah, like I said, they can come in any size. It says here medium to large, but you can't even get them fairly small. Um, so we can see here on the diagram, they tend to be really near the surface most of the year. Uh, however, we do think 
if it's a really uh, hot period, they might disappear down. Uh, they might go deeper to avoid that. So you won't always find them in the top layers of the soil. If it's if it's really cold or getting frosty or it's really dry, they might go further down. Uh, one species, the blue, oh, I forgot, I forgot, the yellow-tailed worm, Octalasian cyanium, it's it's a fair bit bigger than most of the other um, endogenic earthworms, and that will go down even further. So some I think size seems to correlate a little bit with how deep uh, earthworms tend to go as well. And I think it's important to remember that there's variation even within these groups. So what do the endogenic earthworms do? Well, they're involved in nutrient cycling, soil pore creation, and soil aggregate formation. But what they're really, really useful for then is soil aggregate formation. So they, they're really um, helping with that soil process because they're in the soil all the time. They're moving, moving soil around. They're releasing mucus all the time. So they're, they're, and they're casting within the soil. Right, how do we garden for endogenic earthworms? So they live within the soil. Obviously, if we're digging, we're disturbing them. We might be chopping them in half. So having a no-dig policy in your garden is always going to be helpful for them. They're in the soil. So whatever chemicals you put in your garden, they're going to take in through their skin. And even if it doesn't negatively impact them, they might act as a reservoir for those chemicals. So things feeding on the earthworms might end up impacted by the earthworms that have taken in those chemicals. If you think about how many earthworms you see that robin <laughs> flying to and from its its nest with, uh, you can imagine how if each of them has got a little bit of pesticide in, how that will accumulate and can be really damaging, if not fatal, for the bird as well. And water. Um, uh, endogenic earthworms need it to remain fairly moist for them to be able to be active and do what they need to do. So if you've got a bog area in your garden, that's great for endogenic earthworms. Uh, dry patches are, are going to be are going to be a problem for them. Right, epigenic earthworms. So our third and final group. These are the surface dwelling earthworms. So although you can't tell from the picture because of scale, these tend to be much smaller in size. So superficially, they look very similar to the anisic earthworms. They have that pigmentation that means that they're like a dark browny red purpley color um, and they tend to be um, darker towards the head end and on top just like the anesics but they are much smaller and you can be looking at even as small as one and a half centimeters for an adult for our smaller species they're usually found above ground now that can be in dead wood it could be in dung it can be in compost bins it could be in leaf litter any habitat that where you've got organic material rotting down, you can find them there. Uh, so here's an example of one that's been found in, in dead wood. Uh, so what soil processes do epigenic earthworms provide? Uh, they're involved in decomposition, nutrient cycling, and soil pore creation. Where they really come into their own, though, is decomposition. So that's breakdown of leaf litter, uh, other organic matter, so animal waste. Um, we're talking about dead wood as well. And we use them commercially for compost as well. And they'll they break that down, so they're really, really important for waste recycling and detoxification. Right, okay, so how can we garden for epigenic earthworms? Well, we can, again, we can leave the leaves. It's a food source for them. It's the habitat in which they live. So unlike anisic earthworms that, that don't actually live within the leaf litter, but we rely on it for food, these these will there are leaf litter species that you simply won't get if you don't have leaf litter for them to live within. Uh, grass clippings again give them a source of food during summer. Uh, dead wood, so some of them will live within it and they'll live within the actual rotting wood. Some of them you'll find under the bark. Some of them, like the anisics, uh, you'll find resting underneath. So they're involved in the decomposition of dead wood in all stages of decay. So really important for that. Um, you can give them places to shelter. So not everybody has a big garden where they can plant trees and have a bog area. I get that. You might have a small patch of concrete that you can't do anything with um, in terms of planting, etc. But what you can do is 
put a load of plant pots out there and that will give them shelter. So you will get epigeic earthworms uh, living underneath those um, plant pots. Uh, when I surveyed my parents' garden up in Cumbria, I doubled the number of earthworm species I found when I comparing when I just looked into the in the soil to looking at under um, plant pots that were on a, a patch of concrete as well. Uh, again, have a tree, so you'll get earthworms living up trees in rock holes. Uh, these earthworms feed on the leaves, etc. You get them in lots of different microhabitats. So definitely uh if you've got space for a tree brilliant but also having different layers of vegetation is really good for these you've got some that might be associated with plants that are smaller than trees that might be um associated with hedgerows or or shrubbery etc so having different layers within the garden is going to be really helpful for them as well okay so where why are earthworms important for the garden? If we go back to the diagram and we add in all three of those groups, we can see here that they're, they're really important to different degrees for the different soil processes. And it's that combination uh, of earthworms that, that will be, lead to a really healthy garden. Um, so we want to make sure we're doing stuff that helps all of those different categories of earthworms. But it doesn't stop there um, because Although I've categorized earthworms in this way um, to kind of simplify it a bit, it's not actually the reality. So the, the categories of earthworms, the ecological categories, is actually based on their morphology uh, primarily. So it's not being fully tested in relation to their behavior. Um, and what we actually believe is that earthworms are more on a triangular scale. So you can see here, you might get some earthworms that are truly epigeic or anisic or endogeic, but some species uh, may fall in between those or may even fall right in the middle and, and have aspects of their behavior that, that could be considered all three of those. So we need to, we need to consider that when we're thinking about gardening for specific species, because our different species will be found in different parts of that triangle. Uh, and this is something I hope to release a bit more information on. But if you're interested in finding out, in understanding this a bit better, there's a fantastic paper from uh, some French researchers called Boucher's Triangle Revisited. And Will will just be putting the link in the chat and I'll put it in the blog uh, for that paper, which I think you can find openly on the internet. I mean, it's quite fascinating how many researchers are talking about earthworms really definitively in these categories when it's not the reality. So yeah, uh, well worth a read that paper. So that's not the end of the story. And really it's not surprising when we realize that earthworms don't strictly fit in those three categories, that we have things that, that might be a bit different. So I just want to talk about three different types of specialisms in earthworms, but this is not a exhaustive list. I don't think we really know enough about the specific ecology of our different species to know what their specific habitat needs are. Uh, but I just want to mention three specialisms and how you might how that might influence you in how you garden. So first of all, we've talked about the epigeic earthworms, but within them you've got the compost earthworms, and the compost earthworms are really quite specialist. They need microhabitats that are really high in organic content. So you won't just find them in any dead wood. You'll only find them in dead wood that's quite well rotted. Um, you'll find them in dung and you'll find them in our compost bins. So they're looking for habitats, like I said, full of uh, organic content. They look quite different as well. They tend to be quite stripy. Although Icenia andrei, one of the three composting species, is less stripy than the other two, and they're a bit more on a on a scale. Uh, but yeah, so quite distinctive, and they're they're usually quite a bit bigger than the other endogeics as well. So they don't fit neatly. Uh, other epigeics, sorry, they don't fit neatly in that category. You've also got wet soil specialists. So Aperectidae limicola. Uh, Isinella tetraedra, the square-tailed worm, Helodrillus oculatus, one of our rarest earthworms, 
and the two octillasian species, cyanium and lactium, you really, they, these all seem to have a real affinity with really wet soils. Now that doesn't mean you only find them in wetlands. You will find them in gardens that are regularly wet. And a number of these species I found in my parents' garden in Cumbria because it rains regularly there. Uh, Icianella tetraedra is a very common small species that you will get wherever it's wet. So you'll get it in stream beds, lake beds, river banks, etc. But you'll also get it in a wet flush in the middle of a relatively dry field. So wherever there is a wet patch, it will turn up. Um, so you've got these wet soil specialists. And finally, I've started noticing that you've got some species that seem quite synanthropic. So synanthropic means associated with people, associated with human habitats and environments. And two of our species that were until fairly recently classed as relatively rare, Aperectidia icterica and Lumbricus festivus, I find all the time. But I live on the edge of London. I'm regularly surveying uh, fields and nature reserves that are surrounded by an urban environment that have, uh, they, these are not pristine out in the middle of nowhere nature reserves. So I find these really, really regularly. And I personally believe that they're probably associated with hum human uh, populations. So it might be that your garden, if it's next to a park, is particularly good for these species. And if they're synanthropic, what that tells me is they probably like quite a managed environment. Otherwise, you wouldn't just find them with people. So keeping some of the activities you may take in your garden may actually be beneficial for some of these synanthropic species. And like I said, these are just some specialisms. There's loads of others that like we could talk about arboreal earthworms. We could talk about leaf litter specialists, deadwood specialists, etc. The list goes on. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware that there might be some specialisms that we might want to cater for. So if we think about the three that I've said, catering for compost earthworms, no brainer, have a compost bin. If you've got a compost bin, Composting earthworms will find it. There's three different species that you might potentially get that specialize in um, these high organic content environments. Uh, you might also get them in deadwood. So if you've got a deadwood pile, you might get those compost species. And you're not going to get the wet soil specialists unless you've got wet areas. So again, introducing a bog area or a garden pond, things like these will potentially increase your earthworm diversity. So that brings me to the end of the gardening for earthworms aspect of the talk. And now I just want to mention kind of where I'm at. So there will be a link going in the chat to a talk I did on a project called the, and a blog called the Earthworm Image Recognition Project, which is all about trying to figure out whether we can identify earthworms using machine learning or AI and uh, photographs. And I'm, I've been traveling the country uh, and getting volunteers to help me by collecting earthworms. And we've been photographing them in these ice cream tubs to standardize the size and collecting photographs that we're feeding to the Center for Ecology and Hydrology, who are uh, using their tech wizardry to see if we can identify any species of earthworm. So I understand we probably won't be able to identify all species of earthworm using this technology, but there is a chance that we might be able to identify a small number of species. Um, and we've been, yeah, we've been collecting specimens. Now I've got about half the species. I'm missing quite a lot. And some of these are things that you commonly find in garden. So phase four of the project is gonna be a citizen science project. And I need help to do this. So I need the public to help me with it. I'll be launching it around the 2nd of January. So there'll be information going out then. I will make sure that everybody on this talk gets that information. And what I'll be asking people to do is to find an earthworm in their garden that is an adult. Uh, an adult earthworm would need to have a saddle, the fleshy band. And I'd like them to post that live earthworm to me so that I can take some photographs of it in one of my um, standard sized ice cream tubs. And then I would, unfortunately, I would have to then um, kill it and preserve it so that I can then identify it properly under a microscope. Uh, and then I'll have photos of that earthworm, which I can match with that specimen, which I can feed into the um, AI. So hopefully it will be able to reduce the number of earthworm specimens we'd need to take in the future. 
The main aim of this project specifically is to come up with an app that could potentially work for farmers, but I think there's a much wider use of it as well. So I will be sending out information for that at a later date. And I think on that note, I'm aware of the time, I'm going to end the presentation uh, and take any questions.